Okay, we will start the webinar. So, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the second episode of ISU webinar series 2020. My name is Joshua from Indonesian Society of International Law and I'll be serving as your moderator for today. The topic of this webinar is about pursuing a career in international laws, especially in the field of uh, public service. As the topic suggests, there will be three parts of our discussions which we will highlight in two, three different phases in our life. The first one is life as a law student, life as a fresh graduate, and life as a provisional. And then we have an excellent panelist today. So let me start by introducing her. Her name is uh, Ms. Atyanti Sarda Narini Wirajuda, SHDEA. So uh, maybe we can show her CV. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> okay, so um, Bayanti was graduated from Faculty of Law, University of Indonesia, and she obtained her master's degree in international law in an international organization from University of Paris 1, Pantone Sorbonne. And currently, she is serving as the Deputy Director for ASEAN Political Cooperations at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Republic of Indonesia and she has bunches of experience in government affairs, such as uh, being the first secretary for political affairs at the embassy of Indonesia in Singapore, third secretary for political and legal affairs at permanent mission of Indonesia to the UN in New York, expertise in ASEAN legal and human rights issues, as well as women, peace, security, and ministry of foreign affairs of, of Republic of Indonesia under political security affairs. And she also, was the head of Indonesian delegation during the 13th meeting of the ASEAN-China Joint Working Group on, uh, uh, on the kind of parties in China, South China Sea. And she was also a member of Task Force during Indonesia's non permanent membership in the UN. And she was also the, le the lead negotiator for drafting the joint committee of the 52nd ASEAN Foreign Minister meeting. And not forget to mention it also that she's one of the members of Board of Patrons or the founders of Indonesian Society of International Law. So thank you so much Mbayanti for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we are delighted to hear your success story that sure, surely could inspire many law students and fresh graduates who are joining us today. So before we start, a friendly reminder for all participants regarding the format of this webinar. So throughout the whole session, uh, it will be in the form of a talk show where a moderator will ask the panelists several submitted questions from the participants during the, during the registrations. And the questions from the audience are also very welcome during the Q&A between the moderator and panelists. And we will try to address them in accordance with time limit. So without further ado, I'd like to begin with some questions regarding your life as a law student by Andy. Maybe the first question would be, what sparked your interest to study or practice international law? Probably this question is for uh, students out there who are still confused, which specializations to take in their law school? Yes, uh, thank you very much. So um, at that time, at, as you know, in, at the University of Indonesia, we have several uh, jurusan or several uh, specialties that we could choose. And at that time, I was I started to develop an interest for international law and international relations after um, we had the crisis in '98. Um, I was interested in in the impact of uh, of the crisis and how it relates to uh, Indonesia's relations with other countries. And that was further intensified uh, in 2001 when, um, when there was 9-11, as well as other events. And, and I was really interested in the behavior of states, how, they, um, how an event in one country or how um, an incident in one country can affect other countries and how an, a different, each and every issue 
has a, has how each country has a their own interpretation or, or their own interests vis-a-vis uh, various issues and I thought the dynamics of inter interstate relations were very interesting and that was the main reason as to why uh, I chose international law and uh, if I may uh, during my time as a law student I first participated in this um, international moot court competition called the Asia Cup. It was held in Tokyo in 2000. And at that time, uh, we met with other international law students from the Philippines, from Malaysia, from various ASEAN countries, we all got there. And then we had this effective case that we had to argue. So at that time, it sparked my interest. Hmm, this is interesting. Uh, I was pretending to be a representative of a state and I had to come up with legal arguments to justify my country's actions or my country's position on that certain issue. And uh, if you don't mind, Joshua, if I can continue this and how this relates to Indonesian society of international law. Sure, my Andy. And then after coming back from Asia Cup, um, my my friends there they said why instead of just participating in Asia Cup why don't you why don't you guys try uh, the Philip Jessup competition and we said what was that and they said it's um it's the biggest moot court competition in the world and it's held in Washington D.C. every year so we're like okay so when we came back we searched for information about this. Jessup Moot Court Competition, and then we signed up in, so in the University of Indonesia was the first Indonesian team to have participated in the Jessup in 2001. And it was really, really interesting because it took the format of uh, the International Court of Justice. And our case at that time, if I'm not mistaken, was a mixture of uh, of law of the sea and terrorism and all that. And uh, I, together with my three other teammates, uh, namely Aricia Busponogoro mm -hmm. and Maria Irma Yunita and Puguh Priambodo. All are the patrons of PSIL, right? Yes, all of us <laughs> were the patrons and co-founders of PSIL. We had the full support of Professor Hikmahanto Iwana and we left for Washington DC with as much as with, with as much pre preparation as we could because we had no idea what we were going into actually we call ourselves the suicide team because we didn't know what we were doing and then we went up against all these different universities one of my, our opponents one uh, was actually Harvard University it was so horrifying and uh, our teammates Aricia and Irma were the ones who went up against them, and and again that sparked my interest in uh, international law. And then when we came back, we established the Indonesian Society of International Law with a view to uh, making the with a view to enhancing the quality of Indonesian law students and to give them the equal opportunity to take part in moot court competitions and to um, enhance the stature of uh, Indonesian lawyers and students in general. And as you know, afterwards we had um, the case between Indonesia and Malaysia at the International Court of Justice. And again, uh, I had the honor of being there because I was studying at the Sorbonne at the time. And it was such, uh, such cases, such experience that not only sparked my interest in international law, but also led me to joining the foreign ministry afterwards. Yeah. Okay, uh, just to recall, so uh, Bayanti uh, was one of the four members of the first Indonesian, Indonesian JSOP team to present our country in a JSOP competition in 2001 in Washington DC and we just heard also the bit about 
her experience uh, throughout this competition. And probably uh, if you can turn back your time to the past, um, probably will you still want to join the moot court or just being a regular student? Because uh, everyone knows that how busy a student who joined the moot court competition and how to balance between uh, academic and also uh, your uh, your uh, participation in moot court competitions. Yeah. Um, if I could turn back time, I I definitely would do the Jessup again. <laughs> and I definitely would do Asia Cup and establish the Indonesian Society again. Of course, it was very busy. But at the same time, uh, it enhance my ability to do legal research uh, and to uh, be able to make arguments. And uh, most of all, I have, a, it, it, it gives me a lot of pleasure. Uh, it gives me, me, gives me a lot of pride to be able to see my juniors, my, the fellow Indonesian law students, becoming better and better at this compared to to our time at that in 2001 i think our team was ranked last and i was probably one of the uh speakers on ranked last as well and we uh, being a suicide team we didn't know what we were doing but i have zero regrets because i see now that the quality of the students and in the lawyers are much much better and that couldn't give me any make make me any more prouder than that <laughs> so I, we must thank you and your team as well to because of your passions in international law and for yeah. international students you open the way you uh, you open the way for us to yeah. compete also and and to bring another uh, higher level of quality international yeah, competitions I, okay I, but I, <laughs> still in uh, in the questions regarding life as a law student but before we proceed to the next questions i'd like to remind the participants you are op you are you are welcome to submit your questions uh, to our question box probably regarding the uh, question regarding life as law students and it will be the last questions regarding life as law students um, any tips for law students on how to best equip themselves during law school to be well prepared in their working life? Mm -hmm. um, I think you should try to master, try to understand as much as possible uh, the basics. Uh, try to understand, try to enhance your capacity to do legal research and to provide arguments because it will really come in handy when you work at a later stage. Um, I'd like to share some experiences that really that in which the my legal the, my uh, capability of doing legal research came in really handy. Um, if I may, Joshua, um, one of the experiences that I had uh, as a diplomat. This December will mark 17 years of my career in the Foreign Service. Wow. Uh, one of my experiences at the time I was at the Directorate of International Treaties, uh, international, uh, sorry, Political Security and Territorial Treaties, I was involved in the negotiations between Indonesia and Malaysia uh, of Ambalat. It's this uh, block in Sulawesi Sea. And my my ability to do legal research during the Jessup and at law school really came in handy because I had to prepare Indonesia's arguments during the negotiation. So you know how sometimes we have those thick books, you know, uh, uh, cases and treaties and all that. It really comes in handy when you're a practitioner like me. Uh, you 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 can come up with the arguments that are needed to strengthen Indonesia's uh, arguments during the negotiation and during um, the drafting of various conventions and resolutions. So 
uh, I think as a student, you should, you know, really use your time and your opportunity as a law student to really uh, enhance your skills because it will come in very handy when you start working later. Okay, um, Bayanti, you mentioned about uh, we must enhance our skills, right? I, I, I mean, uh, beside moot court competition, do you have any advice? What kind of activities that law students uh, could join uh, in, during their time in law school? So, um, during my time as a law student, I was also active at the uh, ALSA at the ASEAN Law Students Association. And I also took part in the committee, organizing committee of various activities. I think that will be very handy. Having organizational skills will be very useful for you because when you work, it's not only about your intellectual ability and your personal skills, but also your capability of working as a team. Because at the end of the day, uh, sure, you can really excel at what you do. But if you don't have the teamwork skills or if you're not able to work as a team, uh, it, it won't be very useful. You know, it, you, it's not a one-man show kind of thing when you work, especially in the foreign service or in a, uh, a, a career in a public service. You really have to be able to work as a team. Uh, other than that, as a law student, I was also a Noni Jakarta from East Jakarta, which has nothing to do with law, but it was also came in useful uh, because it allowed me um, to, it, in my professional career, it helps, it gave me a lot of skills, but that's a bit off topic, but that's just one of the things that I did as a law student. So, Bayanti, by looking at your activities, many activities joined during your law school life. I mean, like, uh, just to follow up the previous questions, how you balance your academic and also, uh, and also to be an excellent, to be excellent in those activities as well? So, how to balance, the question is how to balance your studies? Yes, my, our studies, as well as uh, those uh, activities that we joined during the law school. Hmm, I think it's about time management. Of course, when you're doing the Jessup, that's a full-time job. You're, it's like you work day and night doing research and preparing the memorials. Uh, but it's, um, I think for that particular stage, it's a bit difficult to balance, but it can be done. You just have to have a division of work with your team. And um, if you have a particular timeline, like objectives that you want to achieve by a certain deadline, if you stick to it, you can do it. And of course, it's difficult when you're studying as a law student because at the same time, you have to prepare for exams and you have a lot of uh, homework. Yeah. So you really have to be able to balance time. But I think, uh, teamwork, having a good distribution of, of, uh, of task and, and, you know, I think it would allow it, I think it, it, could, it could be done. Okay, I think Bayanti has given us a very clear explanation how to be an effective, effective law student during your time in the law school. And I think uh, we're moving on to the next uh, phase of life, which is live as a fresh graduate by Andy. So um, maybe the first question would be, what's life for you after law school? And is it better to directly to apply for a job? Or there are some saying that it, it is the best, best time to take some rest and enjoy life doing some vacations or probably apply for the master degree. Yes, okay, uh, so if I may, I, I graduated in August 2001. And after I graduated, I was a assistant to Professor Hikmahanto Iwana for one semester. It was um, um, 
it was a video a joint lecture between the University of Indonesia and University of North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so we had classes in the evening Jakarta time together with the American law students. And so that was my first work, work experience was as an assistant lecturer to Professor Hikmahanto. And at that time it was really interesting because we had, we had 9-11 and it was the concept of terrorism and is Islam was still ambiguous. So they really thought that, you know, had a lot of them had the wrong perception about Islam. And so it was a really challenging task for me at that time because we had this group of American law students who were very angry at uh, Muslims because of 9-11. And then we had, uh, our we had the Indonesian students on our side who are also very emotional, so we had a very heated debate. But and eventually, uh, the the understanding of terrorism became much better. But at that time, at nine eleven, it was uh, very there were a lot of misunderstandings at that time. And then I got a scholarship from the uh, the French government to pursue my studies at the Sorbonne. And then this relates to your question as to whether we should study first or go to go to work directly. If you're if you choose to enter a career in the foreign service or a, as a civil servant like me, um, pursuing your studies before you enter the civil the your career as a civil servant might have an impact in in your how do you say it um your your in, in indonesian we call it pangkat dan golongan so someone who just entered the who just became a civil servant if they're an esatu would be a tiga a a three a Someone who's an S dua like me would be a Tiga B. But in the and this is regulated by Badan Kapagawayan Negara. So all the civil servants have the same rank, you know, from three A, three B, three C, and it would increase every four years. However, in the foreign service, we not only have three A, three B, three C and all that, we also have diplomatic ranks and this is regulated under the Vienna Convention. So we start our career as an attaché and then as a third secretary, second set secretary and so forth. Now back to my question about go if we should go take our studies before entering the foreign service, if I may suggest it's better to join a it's better to pursue your studies, especially as Tiga, when you're inside the system already. Why do I say that? It's because if you pursue your doctorate before you enter the foreign service, you'll be stuck at the, the rank of 3D, and then it, it would make it difficult for you to to become a counselor. It's a bit difficult for me to explain, but um, let me, like in my case, for example, when I joined the foreign ministry, I was a 3A and because my diploma was still being so I became a 3B six months afterwards, after I was uh, in the foreign service. When it was time for me to become a 3C, they, I wasn't allowed to be a 3C because I was still, my diplomatic rank was still third secretary. And in order to become a 3C at that time, uh, so, um, sorry, 3, 3, yeah, 3C, I had to be a, uh, second secretary so in other words i spent six years as a 3b instead of 
only four years. Whereas my friends who entered the foreign service and then took their master's degree, they went up four years like everyone else. So they didn't have to spend six years as a 3B like me. And I have another colleague. He did his doctorate before entering Kemlu. So he was as a, a 3D. And when it's time for her, him to become a 4A, they couldn't grant him that because his diplomatic rank wasn't equivalent to that. So Baliknya, on the other hand, I have colleagues who took their, mass, their doctorate when they were in the foreign service. And this allowed them to accelerate their diplomatic rank by two years, if I'm not mistaken. So in other words, it's, if you're considering a job in the foreign service or as a civil servant, it's best to do your master's and doctorate when you're in the system. And you also have the benefit of having uh, a lot of scholarships offered to you. So that's also something you should take into consideration. Okay, Bayanti, uh, probably the next question would be uh, from those fresh graduates who wants to work in the foreign affairs. Like uh, for those who wants to be a public, ser a public servant or work in the, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, what kind of qualifications are normally sought by Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the fresh graduates? Okay, so usually they would have a, a list of background or a list of uh, candidates that they are looking for. For example, from law school, they would be cert they would have a certain quota for that. For those from FISIP or from international relations, they would have a certain quota. And uh, from Sastra and all that, they would have that. And they would usually place people with a certain background in, in certain units or directories which they think is uh, most suitable for that person's background. For example, we in law from law school are most definitely most of us would be placed in the directorate general of international treaties because obviously you require someone with a legal background to be there uh, on the other hand in other units like the one that i am now in directorate general of asean cooperation um, we have a mixture of different backgrounds but Wherever I am placed, I really felt that my background as a law, as a lawyer, really came in handy because it allows me to have uh, the ability to to provide legal arguments and legal legal research, which cannot always be done by my colleagues with uh, with who are not lawyers. I think Bayanti to follow up that questions. Uh, there is a question from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, what are the things that needed to prepare? I think you have mentioned, uh, you have explained that before. And probably uh, there's also a question, how to pass in, uh, the entrance uh, exam in case is the, if there is an entrance exam to, to work in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yeah, so the entrance exam at the Foreign Service, we usually have it in several layers. Uh, we have our first layer is the administrative one to make sure you have, uh, you know, the GPA and you have all the, uh, fulfilled all the administrative uh, qualifications. And then we have the essay uh, in which the substantive, uh, they're asked, you're asked to do uh, a lot of you have a, substantive, a lot of substantive questions that you have to respond. And then you have the psychological tests and the interviews. Oh yes, and you also have this one phase in which you uh, have to answer and uh, do the exam in a foreign language. Most 
most candidates use English. So if you know a different language other than English, that could really come in handy. For example, I did my exam in French. So I didn't have a lot of competition, obviously. Uh, whereas my friends who, who did it in English, it's, uh, you had, they had more competition. So some of my friends did it in Russian. Some did it in Chinese. So if you're looking for a career in, at the Foreign Service in Kemlu, having mastering a, a foreign language is very will come in very handy. Mm -hmm. But I think that having a foreign language would be really key, not just for Kemlu, but for other careers in the civil service uh, as well. True, my auntie. And also, um, I read an article in Jakarta Post, so probably the team, tech team can, can show the article. So an article in Jakarta Post entitled, Not a Good Time to Graduate, oh. Pandemic Leave Job Seekers in Limbo. And it shows that many university students approaching graduation have had a job, have had job applications paused or withdrawn because of the coronavirus pandemic. So mm -hmm. probably it, it is a become it becomes a really really big issue nowadays. Uh, any tips or advices on what they can do during this time of period if the jobs are hard to find? I think it's true that um, the pandemic is really impacting our our life and our way of work, but nowadays. Um, we not we we can do a lot of things digitally digitally for example in in asean if i'm not mistaken we have about 235 meetings that are canceled or postponed but this doesn't stop the asean sectoral bodies and the asean meetings from meeting virtually in order to discuss the various issues and Likewise, for for law students, I, I'm I'm sure it's very difficult to find a a job during the pandemic. But at the same time, I think you could make use of the digital era, the technology. Uh, you can do a lot of writing and uh, analytical research. You can take part in uh, web seminars and. I personally think it's a good time to enhance your knowledge and skills through um, through uh, digitally while preparing yourself perhaps for a more uh, for a job. But it could be. I think I'm sure there are opportunities. I think you just have to look for them. And if I'm not mistaken, like Google and Facebook, most of their employees work. You know online so it could be done and i i'm optimistic that and especially young you know brilliant people like yourselves i'm sure you can find uh, a good career okay Mayanti, just to follow up that uh, that questions uh, there is a question from the audience uh, mm -hmm. he wants to ask about whether or not the internship experience is important when we want to pursue a career in public uh, service and mm -hmm. probably there is a, another question. I'm, I think it is related to the previous questions. Um, is there any tips and tricks for those students, those graduates who wants to maybe do an internship or apply for a job in the, another, mm -hmm. uh, institution, another foreign affairs institution like UN or NGOs, mm -hmm. something like that? Yeah, I think internships are, are very important. And it allows us to better understand how uh, it allows us to better understand uh, a certain career or certain work atmosphere. For example, in uh, in Kemlu at the Foreign Service, we have a lot of interns who 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 intern have conducted an internship with us. Uh, sometimes in their third year or fourth year, or even when they graduate, they they can still uh, conduct an internship with us, sometimes three months, sometimes six months. And sometimes they like it a lot, and they even became a diplomat. They got entered 
into the foreign service. And some of them do their internships, not only in Kemlu Pusat in Vajambon, but some of them also did their internship at the embassy. Like, for example, when I was at uh, our embassy in Singapore, I had several interns who conducted an internship at the embassy. And now they are my juniors from the batch of SECU uh, 40 or 41. In Kemlu, we, we, our batch is called SECDU, Sekolah Dinas Luar Negeri. I'm SECDU 29. And I remember uh, I had some interns with me. And now they are SECDU 40 or 41. So, so yeah, it's a good. And you can also conduct internships in, uh, at the UN or at NGOs or even at the ASEAN Secretariat. I think it's, it's good, especially if you're starting to consider a career path in, in, certain, in certain areas. I think before you sign up, it might be good to do an internship there to see if you really like it. So, yeah, it, and, it, I, and you could also see to what extent the budaya kerja and uh, the atmosphere, if it suits you. So, yeah, I think that's a good thing to do. Okay, Mayanti, before we move on to the next discussion regarding the life as a, uh, life as a professional, there is one last question. Uh, 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 probably we'll answer the curiosity from the audience. Uh, the question is, what third language did you suggested for us to learn for pursuing a career in MOVA? Well, hmm. I think, obviously, English, you have to master that. A third language perhaps could be one of the five UN languages that would be useful. As you know, uh, the UN has five official languages, which is uh, English, Arabic, Chinese, uh, Spanish, French, and Russian. Yeah, so that's five or six. Yeah, I, I think mastering those languages would be, would be useful, especially if you're in a, if you happen to be appointed at one of the posts in UN, or for, for example, the, the meetings are conducted in those languages. So it's very useful to know those languages. Okay, I think that's all for uh, to give us the brief uh, descriptions on how life as a fresh graduate. And we're moving on to the very last uh, sec sections, which is life as a professionals. And probably answering one question from the audience. The, the question is, uh, can you elaborate more at the scope of activities that you have in providing public service, uh, in, especially in the sector of public uh, in the sector of public service, I think uh, what he she wants to uh, to to ask is about your experience. Maybe uh, maybe I also would like to ask the what are the most interesting uh, maybe stories or experience uh, in your career. Can you uh, share about, yeah. share us a bit more about that? Sure, sure. So, like I mentioned earlier, uh, my first experience when I joined the foreign ministry was uh, at the Directorate of Treaties, and I was involved in the negotiations between Indonesia and Malaysia. I, and I also uh, took part in uh, in the Straits of Malacca. At that time, we had a lot of armed robbery at sea and a lot of piracy, and they were identifying the Straits of Malacca as a similar situation to that of Somalia. And I was involved in the Bata meeting and such in which we en emphasized uh, that the literal states, namely Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, uh, had full you know, uh, uh, control and, uh, of um, the Straits of Malacca and, and Singapore. Afterwards, I was in the Directorate of International Security and Disarmament. 
And at that time, I dealt with biological weapons. So I dealt with a lot of biosafety and biosecurity labs and uh, making Indonesia's report to the Biological Weapons Convention because we are a party to that. And I was also a member of the task force of Indonesia's non-permanent membership to the Security Council in 2007-2008, as well as now, 2019-2020. And then I moved to New York, and there I dealt with the Security Council as well as the General Assembly. In the Security Council, I dealt with the counterterrorism committees, committees 1540-1267 on Al-Qaeda and Taliban, and Committee uh, 1373. Um, one of the most interesting cases for me was uh, we have a list of uh, terrorists on the Al-Qaeda and Taliban. And one of, one of my most uh, accom biggest accomplishments was when I was able to remove Indonesians from the, some, some deceased Indonesians from the list of Al-Qaeda and Taliban. That was a breakthrough, breakthrough, something completely which hadn't been done before. And I was like, well, I was able to get them out. And uh, I also took part in the drafting of resolutions at the Secu uh, Security Council as well as at the General Assembly. I, at the General Assembly, I dealt with the legal committee, six committee. And I dealt with the resolution on oceans and law of the sea and on terrorism. At one time, I had this really, really challenging task from Jakarta, from capital. They said to inject uh, uh, a paragraph on IUU fishing and other transnational crimes. Because we, at that time, we we suspected that IU fishing was also used for other forms of crimes like uh, human smuggling or for drugs and all that. But at that time, it was 2009, if I'm not mistaken, the concept was still unfamiliar. So I remember when I first introduced that concept in the drafting of the resolution, I was met with a lot of hostility from the other countries, uh, uh, members of G77 in China are like, what is this? Why are you linking uh, are you fishing with other transnational cries? But we, we were successful in putting some paragraphs on that in the resolution. And now it's, uh, it's a fact, it's a study has been conducted and it, it has, they have been able to relate are you fishing with other transnational crimes? Another resolution which uh, I still remember drafting very well was uh, a resolution on the, the black market sales of archaeological artifacts from, uh, from developing countries into museums in, uh, in developed countries. And I, at that time, I had instructions from Jakarta to inject paragraph regarding the need to extradite perpetrators of, uh, of these crimes. And again, I was met with hostility by certain countries who were perhaps engaged in such, uh, such traffic, I, I don't know. And, but I, was, I successfully added that in the resolution. Uh, I think it was done in 2010 or so. And I'm so happy that, you know, when you, when you draft these resolutions, these are, uh, you, you feel that you're part of international law in the making. <laughs> and I was also part of the drafting of various conventions, also uh, in, uh, in counterterrorism and all that. And then after, after my time in New York, I... I was at the ASEAN Political Security Corporation where I dealt with human rights. I, I took part in the drafting of the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. And uh, it was really unique because we brought in, you know, human rights principles, which are 
very unique to ASEAN, but which might not be the same. As you know, human rights, the values are different in, in each, in uh, every region has their own, you know, uh, but, uh, values and principles. So that was really unique to be able to participate in that. And I also dealt with legal issues in ASEAN, such as the drafting of the um, model ASEAN extradition, you know, in ASEAN, and also uh, mutual legal assistance in ASEAN. And after that, I was at our mission, uh, oh, sorry, at our embassy in Singapore. And the experience in Singapore was very different from New York, because in New York, uh, it was under the UN framework, whereas Singapore is bilateral. And I also had some experiences in Singapore, which is very different from New York. For example, we had this corruptor who had spent many years in Singapore, and we weren't able to extradite him. But we were finally able to bring him back to Indonesia to face justice. Uh, it was, even though we did not have an extradition treaty with Singapore, but we used uh, immig through immigration measures, we, uh, it's, it was very unique that, and it shows that sometimes what we learn in theory, in practice, is not always uh, the case. It goes back to uh, the relations among states and how they, you know, there are a lot of considerations. And I also took part, we had this terrorist that um, we was extradited to, was arrested in Indonesia and we extradited him to the U.S. So, you know, it's really interesting to be, to be part of like international law in the making and the practice of it itself. And this brings me back to the point I was discussing earlier with Joshua before the session, is that international law is a means to, to, to support or to make the arguments for, for a country. At the end of the day, it's all about the country's uh, interests and positions. So it can, you can argue your way depending on what you're actually, you know, uh, what, what position your country is taking. And as a negotiator, I, I was uh, the lead negotiator for the drafting of the Code of Conduct in the South China Sea. That was also really challenging because you had the ASEAN member states and you had China and you had, you know, very differing opinions. And so again, that's where you are being a law student, being a lawyer, having that expertise really comes in handy when you negotiate resolutions, conventions and other agreements. Um, and that's how it, your, your legal background will come in very handy for that. Okay, Mayanti, I think I and also all of us here are truly amazed with your, your experience, your accomplishments during your uh, time uh, your service in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But I think uh, I'm also curious, uh, same like uh, one of the attendees here, asking questions like, would you mind to, to spill the tea about the hard life of public servant in foreign affairs? I think, is there any challenging uh, time you encounter during your, uh, in your career, my Andy? Wow, that's... That's, uh, yeah, I must admit that sometimes we do have, you know, we do encounter a lot of difficulties or problems. Uh, but there's also a lot of benefits that come with being a, a diplomat. Um, some of the challenges include, well, being a civil servant, then of course you don't lead a luxurious life. Ya pas pasan cukup lah. So that's sometimes uh, if you're looking for a life of luxury or having a 
you know, that might, this might not be uh, the place for you. <laughs> but if you're lo just looking for, uh, yeah, a nice life, yeah, it's enough, yeah, that should be fine. And um, one of the ad disadvantages and disadvantages is when you're assigned, sometimes you don't know what country you're going to be assigned to. I was fortunate that in New York, my husband came along. So when I had, I had two small children at that time, age uh, a newborn and a two-year-old, my husband came along and he did his studies at NYU. So he was there with me. But during my second assignment in Singapore, he didn't come along with me. But luckily it was Singapore. So he would come every Friday and go back every Monday. But some of my colleagues, they don't have that luxury. Sometimes uh, the, the husband and wife are both diplomats and they are in two different countries that are nearby. For example, Singapore and Johor or Tokyo and some other country, or in, sometimes they're in the same country, but a different city. For example, New York and Washington DC or New York and Chicago. So, so for some it works, for others it's not always very easy. And um, so that's the disadvantage, but the advantages, well, it gives me, my children, the opportunity to study abroad and to learn other languages. So that's always something. And it, they're being trained to become a global citizen because they're used to being, um, to, to exposure to the international world at, at a young age. So I guess it, it, there's a lot of advantages and also disadvantages, but at the end of the day, there's more advantages. <laughs> okay. Mayanti, we got a question here. Uh, maybe uh, he wants uh, you to explain at the hour or, or to elaborate uh, uh, more about uh, the reason why you want to be a diplomat and what is the most important aspect uh, uh, to be a diplomat nowadays. And probably um, in line with the next questions, how is the working culture, work culture in MOVA itself? So, Please wait. So why did I want to become a diplomat? Yeah. Yes, so uh, as I stated in the beginning of my, um, of, the, of the talk, I, I wanted to become a diplomat because I was interested in interstate relations, how states behave uh, towards one another and uh, towards certain issues like for example this pandemic i think it uh, it's really interesting to see how states over try are trying to overcome the pandemic in different ways you know and also regional organizations you have asean which applies a whole of community approach we have all three pillars of the asean community all trying to overcome it uh, the economic, political security, and social culture. And on the other hand, you have other organizations like EU or an African Union who are doing it differently. So the main reason why I entered the Foreign Service was because I, I like see, I'd like seeing how countries, uh, be, uh, the relations between countries. Oh, and another reason why I entered the Foreign Service was uh, I wanted to contribute to the country. I wanted to use my knowledge and skills for uh, in a in a way that could benefit the country. And I must say that during the drafting of uh, negotiate uh, during negotiations and drafting of various agreements, there's a certain pride when you know that you have 260 million, you're voicing out the interests of 260 million Indonesians. And that gives me a lot of pride and, you know, to be able to voice out, not just me, I'm not representing my personal view, but that of my country. And that is something which is totally, wow. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very fortunate that, uh, in my career as Kemlu, I'm able to do that. 
particularly when I was the lead negotiator, I really felt that it was uh, truly an honor to be able to represent the country. And your second question was regarding, I'm sorry, I forgot okay. what's the, work, the working culture in the uh, working in culture. Um, the working culture. So I remember I had this one intern from Padang. He said, I'm so surprised. I thought that civil servants work from, you know, <laughs> like nine to nine to from eight to four or nine to five. But why is it that in Camu you're working till so late at night and everyone is so I think in Camu we're a bit different from other uh, other government institutions in which we don't really have a fixed time schedule we we really work like almost 24 hours saturday sunday it's very very tiring and i think it's we also have a our standard is maybe it's because we were so used to dealing with foreign foreign uh foreign with other countries with other regional organizations so uh our our standard in making you know our when we when we make uh, statements and speeches and prepare for meetings is very different from other countries i mean for, from other institutions sorry in my line of work i work a lot with other with other government institutions for example with the police with tni with and all that and uh, it's 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 very it's very different in the sense that um, it's not an, a day to it's not a how do you say uh, if you're a person like me who doesn't like routine then yes, a, a diplomat would work for you because I, I don't like routine. And every day at the Foreign Service is totally different. I, I never do the same thing ever. <laughs> so, but, I, but I think if you, if you have a background in international law and you want to do a career in the civil service, you can do so in almost all the government institutions they have that they all have this bureau kerjasama luar negeri or that you can apply your international law or for example at uh, kemkumham they have the directorate of international treaties and there they all the mutual legal assistance requests are through there and in polri you have the divisi hubungan internasional and at in tni angkatan laut you have uh, the legal division so it's I think if you have a background in law or in international law and you're interested in a, a certain career in, this, in civil service you, I think it can be whatever you choose having a law background will be beneficial for you in whatever career you choose uh, believe me it, it, it's very if you're a law student then good for you <laughs> Okay, my auntie, I think one last question to answer, which, okay. which is uh, how the COVID-19 pandemic changed your working uh, uh, style and how it changed uh, the way you work in a MOVA. Wow. So ever since the pandemic hit, uh, in, in starting in March, we work on a picket basis, you know, but there was a one time in which all of us worked from home and it's for me it became more challenging because i have three kids and all of us are always fighting over the laptop and who gets to use it for <laughs> because they have to use it for school and i have to use it for work and and i think be working from home it's more the workload is more than being at office because the boss 
or the work can be done at any time. So it just keeps coming in no matter at what time. I remember last April, we were, we were preparing for two ASEAN summits and we had to work on it from home and it's, it's not easy, but I think the pandemic really changed our, our method uh, of work and our lifestyle and, and we have to adjust to the new normal. Yeah, sure. I think all of us just to adapt to the new normal. Well, I think our time is uh, running out. Before we close, let me just say thank you so much to our panelists, Bayanti, who has shared us many tips and tricks, as well as important advices on how to pursue a career in international law. And allow me also to thank all the audience who joined us today. We have so many dialing in almost from all provinces in Indonesia. It is very encouraging for us. So let me just uh, I'll give you uh, the data that we received. So there are 19 universities from Indonesia joining us today. Wow. And That's three fun. universities from outside Indonesia. There are Universidad del Rosaria from Argentina, and, wow. and US and also Groningen, and seven law student organizations, and five institutions such as OJK, Paradi Law Firms, and Amnesty International. Thank you so much for joining us today. Wow. Thank you so much, and I hope my explanation was clear, and I hope that you found it beneficial. Sure, my Andy. And just to let you, just to let you know, we have more webinars to come. Uh, tomorrow we have third episode of our webinar, and also there are another webinars which we will discuss more substantial with with more substantial discussions during our second to the fourth uh, week of webinars. So please. Follow our social medias, which are our official Instagram at Jezab Isil. And please also subscribe our YouTube channel, Isil Event, where you will watch the rerun video. So we will upload these webinar sessions in our uh, YouTube channel a week after uh, today. And also please uh, send us email if you have any inquiries to Isil Events at gmail.com. And please do visit our official website for more information to come regarding any activities that will be uh, run by uh, ISIL. So once again, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much, Bayanti, for your time. Goodbye. See you. Goodbye. See you.